imagine the scene. It is the day before the big exam in the school. Um, and a student from the school goes into the head teacher's office and he sees there stacked up piles and piles of exam scripts and, and he turns them over. He fl flips the exam papers into the air. He tips over the head teacher's desk. He causes quite a scene. The head teacher comes in and finds the student there doing this and quite rightly says, what are you doing? What authority have you got to do this in this school? Or imagine the scene from just about a month ago, wasn't it? It seems longer than that now, with the storming of Congress in America, as people piled through into the congressional building and caused havoc. Tables were overturned, signs were ripped down, police had to be brought in, the army as well. It's quite... Uh, a scene, isn't it? It's something, some kind of scene like that that we're supposed to have in our mind as we picture this morning's passage this morning. We, we mustn't let the familiarity of this scene of Jesus clearing the temple dull our senses to the shock we're supposed to feel as we read it. But before we look at this passage in any detail, let's get something out of the way, first of all, at the beginning. Jesus is not angry, I don't think, because things are being sold in the temple. That's not quite what is going on here. You see, things were being sold in the temple for good reason. Remember what the temple was about. You would go to the temple and you would bring your animal. Perhaps it was a lamb, perhaps it was a pigeon. Um, and you would bring, according to the Old Testament law, a perfect lamb. You would bring a perfect pigeon and you would sacrifice it there or it would be sacrificed there for you on your behalf to cleanse you of your sin. But of course, there were Jews living very many miles away from Jerusalem. Maybe they lived up in Judea uh, and they would have to travel to the temple. Uh, and you can imagine the, their frustration as they traveled through uh, Judean countryside down to Jerusalem with their perfect lamb, only to have them just enter the road to Jerusalem to the temple and he trips over and falls and he grazes his knee or breaks his leg. Goodness me, I've got to go back home and get myself another perfect lamb. So what happened actually was that animals, perfect animals were sold in the temple for people to buy so that they would be able to use these animals in their sacrifices. It was a handy thing that happened to help. And of course, because you're coming from different places, you would need your money changed to be able to do that. So Jesus isn't actually primarily angry about the sale within the temple. What's Jesus angry about then in this passage? Well, in part, that depends on what version of this we're reading. Are we reading the account of the clearing out of the temple from Matthew, Mark, Luke or John? Because in Matthew, Mark and Luke, called the synoptics, because they, they share a lot of what they say in common. In the synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke, Jesus says, this is meant to be my father's house, a place of prayer for all the nations. That's not actually something that Jesus says in our account in John this morning, but Jesus says it in the others. And you, you see, you have to understand that the temple had an outer court, a courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles. And it was in that area that all this stuff was being sold, you see. Uh, and so what Jesus is objecting to in Matthew, Mark and Luke, at least, is that this area that was reserved for the Gentiles, for the nations, to come and meet with God was, by the Jews of the day, being taken over and there was no space for them to come because it would be turned into this great marketplace. Jesus is angry in those accounts at the exclusion of the Gentiles, exclusion of the world. Uh, and Jesus said, no, this is not right. And he cast them out. But that is absent, as I say, from John's account. Instead, in John's account, John doesn't say this is a house for all nations. Instead, John wants us to see this morning in this passage, the true temple of God, the true temple of God entering the old temple of God, 
and declaring himself its true fulfillment. In summary, the point of this passage in John's Gospel is out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old, in with the new. And that's going to be our two headings as we go through the passage this morning. First of all, out with the old. It's Passover time and Jesus goes to Jerusalem. He goes to the temple. To understand what is going on here, we have to understand what the temple is. The temple was, for first century Israel, the beating heart of their religion. It's not good enough to think about it in, in our terms as sort of it's a bigger church or something like that. Because the temple was, yes, it was the place where preaching and prayer happened, like a church building today. But more than that, it wasn't just a place where preaching and prayer happened. It was a place for the presence of God and the propitiation of God. Big word that ends in shun right there that we looked at earlier. The presence of God, the temple of God was where you would go if you wanted to meet with God. This is where God himself in all his holiness, in all his glory dwelt. And if you wanted to meet with him, you better come to the temple because there is no other way. But it was also the place of propitiation. If you want to meet with God as a sinner, then you need to come and offer your sacrifice for sin so that you are cleansed and able to meet with God. So in many ways, the temple of God represented and stood for the way in which God's people Israel met with God and were made ready to meet with God. And it's into that context that Jesus steps and causes this scene. And he drives out all the animals. Again, this is an emphasis in John's account that's not present in the others. In John's account, we're told he drives out the pigeons, he drives out the sheep, he drives out all the animals from the temple. John wants to make it very clear to us that there are no animals left in the temple. Do you see what's happening? It's quite literally out with the old. But before we look at in with the new, I want to just briefly speak on Old Testament promises to help us grasp what's going on here. The Old Testament is full of promises, isn't it? In many ways, you might be able to think of some. Uh, lots concerning the, the fact that God is going to send his Christ, his Messiah, to save his people. And so when we get to the New Testament and we can read a passage like 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 20, Paul writes, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. Jesus is the fulfilment of all God's promises. But promises come in all sorts of ways, don't they? Sometimes they are spoken promises. God says something like, I promise I will send my Messiah and he will be born in Bethlehem. It was a spoken promise of God. But sometimes such promises come not as though they're spoken, but they come in signs or images or pictures. Take, for example, the temple. The temple was representative of God being with his people, present among his people. And so that sign, that picture of the temple is longing for a fulfillment when God will truly come and be present with his people. With that understanding of promises from the Old Testament in our minds, let's head now away from out with the old and let's look at finally in with the new. Jesus has cast out all the animals, hasn't he? Every single animal has been driven out of the temple. Or have they? Because if we've been reading attentively to John's gospel so far, one animal remains in the temple, doesn't it? Remember chapter one of John's gospel, verse 29? What does John the Baptist cry? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, Jesus has driven out all other animals out of the temple, all these inadequate, insufficient animals that cannot save and cannot bring forgiveness. And literally, he stands in the temple courts in their place. And later on in John's gospel, he will die in their place as well. Jesus is the fulfillment of the true sacrificial Lamb of God. But more than that, even, because Jesus didn't come only to win our forgiveness 
as amazing as that is, but he came to bring us God's presence with us forevermore. You see, this, this other aspect of what the temple was about, yes, it was about propitiation, it was about a cleansing of sin and forgiveness, but it was also about the presence of God. And again, if we've been attentive readers to John's Gospel, you might remember back in chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, or literally in the Greek, tabernacled among us. God, Jesus came and pitched his tent, his tabernacle among us. You see, Jesus is the true temple of God, as he says here in this passage, the presence of God among his people. Jesus is where we are to go when we want to meet with God. He is our true lamb and our true temple. That's what John wants us to see here. Out with the old. Stop clinging or hanging on to these old ways of, of trying to get right with God. And in with the new, come to Jesus. Come to this true and final fulfilment of how we're to come into the presence of God. And so as finally we close, when we think about how we can apply this passage to ourselves, we need to, all of us, ask ourselves, what part of the old am I clinging to, am I holding to, that needs to be driven out of my spiritual life? What am I holding on to for salvation or hope or to be right before God? It's unlikely that many of us, I think, probably are trusting in Old Testament sacrifices. I don't know many of us who've got a lamb or a pigeon in the cupboard that we just can't wait till lockdown ends so we can fly over to Jerusalem. Uh, and of course, the temple's not currently there at the moment, um, uh, but maybe we're going to wait until it's built again and then we can make the sacrifice. I don't think many of us live like that, do we? We're probably not trusting in Old Testament sacrifices. But there are things probably that we're trusting in that uh, we need to ask ourselves, am I trusting in this for my ultimate hope, for my ultimate clinging on, for saying this makes me right before God? Maybe it's the life we've lived, maybe it's the good things we've done, the generosity that we've shown to others, maybe it's that we think we're right before God because, well, we were brought, in, brought up in a Christian family or we come to church. Maybe it's just the fact that we're English. Who knows what it will be? What it, might it be that you are holding on to? Jesus, in this passage, challenges all of us to cast out the old. These other ways that we might think are, will make us right with God are doomed to fail. Jesus alone is sufficient. For that task, he alone can bring us into the very presence of God himself. He is our true lamb dying for us, our true temple. To know him is to know the presence of God himself.